worldwide fans of the planet's hottest entertainment with an edge. I'm Ian Fuego here, so stoked, as always, to be welcoming you to my namesake program, and Fuego Tainment! That's right, you can just call me Fuego for short. And this is another Fresca Fuego review, and one that I am pretty positive is going to make buttloads of money this upcoming weekend. That's right, the not live action, as I have been corrected countless times at this point, the CGI remake of The Lion King. That's right, Disney proceeding forward with more of their taking their 2D animated things and putting them into a realistic setting is I guess how I will try to dance along these lines because so many people are like, it's not live action, it's not live action, everything's digitized. And you know what? They're completely right. And it's the most breathtaking looking, completely digitized film that I have ever seen. I still remember way, way back, like what, 15, 17 years ago or whatever, when uh, Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within, I think it was called, and then there was that, um, uh, there was the FF7 film that they did, what, Advent Children, I want to say, and, you know, there's been various things since then, you know, they, they made some Deep Space movies, there's been those Resident Evil films, and, but this is without a doubt the greatest looking uh, computer generated image film that I have ever seen, and that is where this does stand apart from the previous film uh, for Disney that John Favre did in The Lion, or excuse me, uh, The Jungle Book, bleh, because of the fact that, yeah, we did have a single human actor, and uh, yet everything else was digitized in that. So basically, this is just cutting the human element out and going completely with digitized animals, environments, and everything else, and yet it is pretty much a straight remake perhaps bordering on uh, the Gus Van Sant's approach with Psycho, which, uh, you know, we will get to all of that stuff here momentarily. So on Enfuego Team, and if you're new to the proceedings, I always like to do bueno, malo, feo, that's right, boom, 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 just like you see below there. And so starting out with the bueno, I just have to double down on the fact that this film, I saw it in IMAX 3D as well, and it was legit breathtaking. I was in awe at just the realism, the beauty of these digitized environments that Favre and his team put together. I mean, I thought that everything looked pretty beautiful for The Jungle Book, but this just blew that out of the water from a couple years back. And I mean, the animals, just the fibers of the hair, just the detail on the rocks in Africa. I mean, my goodness, the lush greenery when we get to some of those areas, the dilapidation of like, uh, you know, the, the elephant graveyard and all this other stuff. It is such an incredible, Incredible, amazing, just awe-inspiring film. Just the fact that technology has come so far in the computer-generated image realm that we can make stuff like this that legitimately, with the exception of the texture and a few of the animals, and I mean just a very few minute little things here and there, you truly feel like you are in the real world while watching this film. I mean, we are so far beyond this type of stuff that we got in, you know, some of those other CGI films that I really, really like. Like, um, oh boy, The Polar Express is one. Um, uh, so, oh boy, I'm trying to think of the other one that uh, Zemeckis did, which had an amazing cast as well. I mean, there's been various stabs at it, but this is officially, officially, the new benchmark for this sort of filmmaking. It's incredible looking, and I must say, um, I was not that inspired by the cast and their voice work, but we will get to that here in the Malo here in a little bit, but I do have to double down on the few voices that I thought were as good, if not better, than in the 1994 animated film. The 1994 animated film, mind you, boasted a lot of big time talent, uh, one of which was, you know, Matthew Broderick voicing the, the grown up Simba, uh, also, uh, oh boy, I mean, Jeremy Irons as, um, as Scar, and then Nathan Lane as, uh, what, uh, Timon, I wanna say. I, I can't, I, honestly, this is the one thing I have to mention real quick, is that, the Lion King is not a film that is like in the upper echelon of Disney for me. I said pretty much the same thing when I was reviewing Aladdin a few months ago in the fact that I was I was creeping towards uh, being a teenager, okay? By the time Disney was having this renaissance that included Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King and stuff like that. And so, yeah, for, with those three, they, 
I, I mean, Disney for me, as far as personal favorites goes, it's always been the much older stuff like Alice in Wonderland, um, Sleeping Beauty, stuff like that. So those are personal favorites of mine, Pinocchio, um, boy, Snow White, if we're going like much older with those two entries, and so Fantasia, damn. And so, yeah, uh, when Disney was having this renaissance, it started with The Little Mermaid in what, 88, 89, something like that, and then carried over into the early and mid 90s. And I just, I was, past the point of interest, I was like, Disney's not cool anymore, man. And I know I touched upon that in my Aladdin journey. And so I think that that was actually a good thing that I came into this film without just having The Lion King so near and dear to my heart because I feel like with those people, it's gonna go one of two ways. It's either gonna be, you know, just show it to your kids and uh, you know it's just so much greater looking and all this other stuff or you're gonna feel like what is the point of this movie because it is in a lot of ways scene for scene with the exception of a very small bit of tinkering here and there pretty much the exact same movie down to lines down to shots down to everything and i guess i will cover that further in the malo but as far as the new set of voice actors goes i mean I, I did enjoy uh, Donald Gambino, the Childish Glover, um, uh, whatever his his name is. But um, yeah, I mean, I I loved him on you know Parks and Rec in Atlanta, and he's a, a hell of an actor, hell of a performer. And I actually thought that he was he was very good, but he he didn't absolutely wow me. And I'll get to the others that didn't really impress me as much once we get to the model here in a moment. But the two names that I have to mention that believe it or not, I actually think were better in this were most notably as great as Jeremy Irons was Should we tell Edge you for as Scar, the new Scar? Holy shite, man. He is so foreboding and so emotive and so good in this. Uh, he's, he's a terrific villain. The uh, hyenas nowhere near as memorable in this one as in the previous where we had like Cheech Marin and uh, Whoopi Goldberg and stuff. So nowhere near as good. Sorry, uh, Keegan Michael Key and some of the others that were involved in that. But honestly, the character who absolutely stole the show. That's right. Nathan Lane, I love you. You were terrific in the original. And Seth Rogen is pretty damn good in this too. But without a doubt, just the chemistry between Seth Rogen, but most notably Billy Eichner, I want to say his name is. Uh, I, I know he's done uh, various things, but he's not a dude that I'm completely familiar with. But he steals this movie 100%. And they have just... The way that he delivers his voice work in such amazing alignment with just the movements and everything of this meerkat, I guess it is, if I'm not mistaken, and it's just, I laughed so hard at a few instances in particular, and just his dynamic with Rogan and how they change up a few of the songs in particular, I mean, it's the best part of this movie, with the exception of uh, Edgy Four's work as Scar. It's, it's really legitimately fantastic and funny and just, I don't know, it, it took me off guard because I enjoyed Timon and Pumbaa as characters in the original one, but man, this I, I liked better. I like these two better in this one and they are, yeah, they are easily the best part of the movie, especially for some of the different nuances they brought to a few of their, of their parts here and there. So yeah, uh, a couple of those voice actors in particular and just how incredible and amazing just to use both of those descriptors once again. This film is legit the best of the CGI camp that we have ever seen. Now to jump into the Malo, and the Malo is the fact that um, some are definitely going to question the point of this movie. That might even be more so a feo, so I guess maybe I'll save that uh, with the uh, you know inclusion of a few spoilers as well. But yeah, the, the voice work in certain instances was nowhere near as strong. I already mentioned the, the pack of hyenas. Beyonce's voice work is not very good in this. It's really not. And as much as I liked uh, Donald Glover in his role, Mr. Childish Gambino, as the uh, adult version, um, the kid from The Pains, who does the young, uh, the young, uh, the, oh boy, Simba man, I wasn't feeling it. Really, really wasn't. And, you know, it's great to have James Earl Jones back, but since they recast everybody else, there's, you know, everybody says it's like, you don't recast the voice of Darth Vader, so you don't recast the voice of uh, Mustafa, you know, and, uh, or Mufasa, man, I said Mustafa, damn, I feel like such an idiot. Uh, but, you know, you, you can't, you can't recast that voice, right? I think you can, and I think you should have, personally. I genuinely do, and that's not to say James Earl Jones doesn't crush it, of course, he does in 
everything, whether he's on screen or doing voice work. He's one of the greatest actors of, uh, of the last like 50, if not 100 years, you know? But I think they should have gone with somebody else. I, I really do. Uh, who else, you know? Uh, boy, everybody else is just pretty forgettable as far as the voice work goes. And so that's definitely a Malo. Um, but, th and, and that other Malo is also the fact that they didn't really deviate enough in this as far as changing enough things. There was just that very minor amount of tinkering here and there. And so, as opposed to beating this film up, because honestly, I, because of the fact that I don't hold this film near and dear, there were certain parts where I'm like, there, there were parts where I definitely knew were in the original film, and I was like, yep, I remember that beat, I remember those angles, I remember that stuff, you know, with the with the, the baboon or, you know, whatever. And uh, yet, there were other instances where I was just like, hmm, them pushing around, you know, uh, you know, Simba's fur in the crap ball with the dung beetle, presumably, and stuff. Was that in the original movie? I couldn't remember. So, for that reason, it was actually good. And I, I really enjoyed this movie actually, which I will mention when I, you know, to just you know sum things up here at the very end. But I actually did really, really like this movie. And so, yeah, once again, the Malo will probably be those who just wonder, you know, if this needed to be made, which segues us into the fail. Did this really need to be made? I guess it's just really kind of a, I don't know, is it a dick measuring contest to some degree? Just, you know, Disney showing the amazing technology that they have right now, as opposed to trying to tackle a new property, because whereas, I, I mean, back when they were doing so many live action things, you know, back in what, the 60s and I think 70s, when you had stuff like the black hole and, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to leagues under the sea and all that other stuff. I mean, yeah, they were, and even the Herbie movies and stuff like that, Disney, used to do live action stuff that was kind of either, it, it just hadn't been adapted before, even if it was, you know, you know, based off literature or whatever else. And so we're not in the live action realm, or in this case, the CGI realm to look as realistic as possible. We're not getting original properties done that way. We're saving all of that for Pixar. And even Pixar is really just primarily sequels, I feel like, at least lately. We're not getting as much on the original route. We're, so, uh, I, I don't know, so that's definitely Feo, if this movie really needs to be made. Um, and Feo, you know, let's just do some spoilers. One thing that really, oh yeah, you know, ugly is the fact that the two new songs really sucked in my opinion. Elton John, who did the music for the original film, uh, you know, just made so many of those, those memorable cuts, you know, Circle of Life and Can You Feel the Love Tonight, and we'll get to Can You Feel the Love Tonight in just a moment, but his new song about, uh, just, it's in the post credits, it's terrible, feels uninspired, it's boring, and also Beyonce's song that, uh, I, I was really honestly wondering if they were gonna use any stuff from the uh, Lion King musical, because I know it's been on Broadway, and I do, well, okay, I, I'm pretty sure that they added some songs specifically for the Broadway thing, and I was wondering if they were gonna show up in this, and to the best of my knowledge, they didn't. I think Beyonce's song wasn't original, it wasn't her doing one of the Broadway things, but I should have probably double-checked on that research-wise before I did this, so correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below. But yeah, for both of the new songs for the film to be just blah, that's definitely fairly ugly, and Minor, minor spoiler. You know that they're gonna do Can You Feel the Love Tonight, okay? They turn it into a duet. You've probably heard it. I'm sure it's floating around on the internet somewhere. I'm sure the soundtrack is out. And it makes sense to have a Childish Gambino slash Beyonce duet where, you know, guy sing guy part, girl sing girl part, and have it go back and forth. It makes sense. It totally makes sense. What does not make sense is to sing Can You Feel the Love Tonight during the daytime. It's day, the entire time that they're singing this song. What the hell? Is that me nitpicking? Possibly, but it just, I don't know. Why are you singing about Can You Feel the Love Tonight in the Daylight? Doesn't make sense! Fookie's love on end or you must have quit. So, I don't know, but these are all minor gripes at the end of the day, and really, in some ways, I understand how some people were just like, uh, the animals didn't didn't emote well enough, you know, you can't see facial expressions on animals, and that was one of the great things that we had in the, you know, JTT and uh, Broderick, and, and just, the, you know, seeing Simba actually crying, and you know, the sadness on his face when, you know, uh, Mufasa is dying, and just, you know, it's not quite the same when you just see, a, they try to do a lot with eye movement, and, and things like that, and some of the songs didn't look anywhere near as good because of that, but I didn't really have that great. 
You know, the animals looked like animals and I felt like body language and, you know, eye movement and stuff like that did get emotion enough pretty, just across pretty well, you know, at least enough for me. And so, I don't know, I actually, I think the, the purists who are just in love with The Lion King, who are comparing it too much to the original, since the original wasn't like pure, hollowed, sacred ground for me, I actually think in some ways I like this better than the original, even if I did have some gripes with a few things here and there. Uh, maybe not better, but it's just like, it, it's on par, and it's, I don't know, I can't say I, at this point, with as breathtaking visually as it was, and it is really great 2D animation in that original Lion King, but I think both of them are really good, you know, in their own rights, and so that's, I guess, where I'm gonna leave it at that, and say that this is three out of five Fuego Fireballs, that's right, it is a bueno film, it is a good film, and I urge Everybody, if you are a big fan of the property, or if your kids have never seen the original animated film, whatever, it does have some tense and scary moments, obviously. So keep that in mind if you're taking the, the little ones or whatever. But yeah, it's definitely a solid, strong film. Uh, I, I wasn't the hugest, hugest fan of Father's The Jungle Book either. I'm waiting for The Mandalorian, so uh, I'll just wait around for that. But yeah, he has that. I mean, you cannot sell short the amazing, just visual just landmark that both you know the jungle book and even more so this film is so yes three out of five and i'm gonna call it there everybody so i have been jaime and fuego you can find moi on all social media sectors like twitter instagram facebook here on youtube and if you haven't done the like share and please portofa y gracias subscribe thing it is supremely appreciated uh, also i did a trailer reaction for jane silent bob reboot which had its first trailer debut just this past week at uh, San Diego Comic Con, it uh, it's it, it was a uh, it, it's a great trailer, and I can't wait for that film's release in October. I've also done a lot of reviews lately. I always do at least one, sometimes two new ones every week. I've also been doing Star Wars canon coverage. So just recently, I put up reviews of uh, the the Queen Shadow, which is a Star Wars novel about Queen Amidala, set between Episodes One and Two of the prequels that came out earlier this year in March, if I'm not mistaken. And then I also did my second comic review of Obi-Wan and Anakin. I've been basically going in timeline order covering all of the films, comics, novels. I also did Master and Apprentice earlier this year, which is a pre-episode one novel written by Claudia Gray about Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan, much younger Obi-Wan, going on a mission together. And I also did the uh, Dooku Jedi Lost, which was a great audiobook. So yeah, there's tons of cool stuff to check out here in the galaxy far, far away on Fuego Tainment. But you need to check out if you want spectacular coverage and you're here because of that, because you saw me there, make sure to jump back over to the Horror Show channel, youtube.com slash the Horror Show channel, where I am, boy, just about every day on that. And it's tons and tons of fun. There is one, sometimes two videos every single day. Uh, we did the It Chapter 2 final trailer reaction recently, myself and Cecil, for my program, Hail to Stephen King. That's right. And uh, yes, we also do film reviews, book reviews, comic reviews, television reviews, as well as the aforementioned trailer reactions and uh, convention coverage, video game let's plays, unboxings, all kinds of radness. And lastly, I always have to mention the fact that every Monday evening on the Will This Screedia YouTube channel, I take part in a program called Show Business, hashtag Show Business. 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, and it is breaking down the previous weekend's box office numbers, both domestically and internationally. Then we look ahead to the stuff that's coming out the following weekend in theaters, give some numbers predictions, and we also have a little bit of palaver about some of the biggest news stories of the previous week. So that's going to be the end of the proceedings for today. Once again, a grande gracias, and until the film reel of Ka comes around once more, ha ha! I shall say hasta luego, sin amigos, but I am hopeful that we get to share more film palavras sooner rather than later. And until then, peace out.